so glad you could come out for this very, very special evening tonight. I'm Mitchell Kaplan, and I'm with uh, Books and Books, a co-sponsor of the event tonight. Thank you. We at, uh, at the bookstore always love when we can partner with the Center for uh, Writing and Literature here at Miami-Dade College because uh, my heart uh, and so many of us at the bookstore are right here at the college with all the wonderful things that they do. Uh, it's just, um, um, it, it just elevates anything that we do when we do it with the college. So we thank them for, uh, for doing this with us. I just spent a couple of minutes, uh, kind of a couple of dream minutes. Um, not only did I have uh, the opportunity to spend a couple of minutes with a hero of mine, Magic Johnson, but I also got to watch Magic and Mike interact, which was really a wonderful preview of what you're gonna get right here tonight. I also wanna say that uh, I got a call, I guess it was about six months ago, uh, from Dave Lawrence, who asked me if I would help out a friend of his uh, named Mike Fernandez and maybe talk a little bit about the book trade uh, with Mike. And that began a uh, month -long, months long journey for me on uh, learning about someone who I've come to admire so very greatly. Uh, all of you who haven't read his book, you'll understand a little bit about it when you do read Humbled by the Journey. But I was also uh, so impressed with watching him up close and personal uh, with his commitment for, uh, for uh, helping uh, those who need some help and trying to make sure that we do have uh, a next generation, a next generation not only of readers, but a next generation of informed, healthy, and well-educated young people. And that, I think, as you'll find out, is the purpose of this book, of, of writing this book. And as you know, all of the proceeds of this book uh, go to that end. Um, I also should tell you that if you'd want to get a copy, all of this book right now, Humbled by the Journey, is sold out, except for the hundreds of copies we have right out there. And they're all signed by Magic Johnson and by Mike. So I think you should be planning your Christmas gifts for this coming year and uh, make sure you buy 10 at a time, uh, and you'll be able to do that uh, after the event as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring up to the podium um, someone who personifies all that I said about Miami-Dade College. Len Lenore Rodicio is the provost of academic and student affairs for the entire Miami-Dade College system. She joined Miami-Dade College in the fall of 2002 as an adjunct instructor of chemistry at the Kendall and Inter-American campuses. Since then, she has held a number of positions at the college, including professor, the chair of the Natural and Social Sciences Department, and dean of academic affairs. Dr. Rodicio holds a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry from Barry University and a doctor of philosophy in chemistry from LSU. Please give Dr. Lenore Rodicio a warm welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Our college president, Dr. Eduardo Padron, is currently traveling abroad. Otherwise, he would be here personally in order to welcome his friend and a great supporter of this college, Mike Fernandez. On his behalf, I would like to welcome all of you here tonight to our Wolfson campus and to extend an especially warm welcome to Mike's family who is with us here tonight. As I read... <laughs> As I read Mike's book, it occurred to me that we could find no better place to have this book debut than the campus that houses the Freedom Tower. As you know, the tower represented a new opportunity for thousands of Cuban Americans who were processed there in the 1960s. And while their route didn't bring them through the Freedom Tower, there is no doubt that Mike and his family made the most out of that opportunity, but more importantly, they found a way to repay that opportunity through their philanthropy in the communities in which they've lived. 
to truly care for those that came after, as Mike says in his book. To tell you a little bit about, more about Mike and his journey, I now have the privilege of introducing to you another well-loved member of our community who will serve as the host for tonight's program, David Lawrence. David retired in 1999 as publisher of the Miami Herald to work in the area of early childhood development and readiness. Although he boasts numerous accolades, I'll highlight only a few this evening. Currently, David is the president of the Early Childhood Initiative Foundation and an education and community leadership scholar at the University of Miami School of Education and Human Development. Most notably, David was the founding chair of the Children's Trust and in that role was responsible for securing a dedicated source of funding for children in our community. He leads the Children's Movement of Florida and is a member of the Governor's Children's Cabinet. I think his commitment to the youth in our community is very evident. So welcome, David. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll start by asking Irvin Johnson and Mike Fernandez to join me up here. I, I am Mike Fernandez. <laughs> that helps me a lot. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we have a full house with some people standing. And I welcome you to the Mike and Magic Show, or if you follow the LA Lakers, I welcome you to Showtime. I know what to call Miguel Benito Fernandez because everyone calls him Mike. And what to call Mr. Johnson is a tad more complicated. His mother sometimes called him Junior, as in Irvin Johnson Jr. I give you the little known fact that before he was tall, he was chubby. <laughs> and people regularly called him Junebug. Now, his Laker teammates called him Buck. And most of us would call him Magic, which was a name given to him when he was in high school in Michigan by a sports writer. But if you read his books, you'll find this sentence, Magic is who I am on the basketball court, Irvin is who I am. So for us tonight, he is Irvin. Now you're gonna wonder, what our new two speakers have in common. And they might seem some different to you, but I wonder how much. Yes, of course, it's fairly obvious that Mr. Johnson is a tad taller than Mr. Fernandez. <laughs> Indeed, 11 inches. And yes, one of them was born in this country and the other came from Cuba at the end, age of 12. And yes, Mr. Johnson is among the world's great sports legends. And no, or yes, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Fernandez does not follow any sports. <laughs> but I want to focus on the similarities and what they have in common besides being good friends and business partners and quite extraordinary entrepreneurs who can see niches and underserved opportunities that most of us I dare say, would not. Each had great parents who raised children of giving and generous spirits, people who contributed to community and those less blessed. Neither finished college, though both of them would tell you they would like everyone possible who wants college to be able to finish. Each is a person of faith, faith in people, faith in a higher and greater being. Both truly loved to hug people. And God gave them both great smiles, which becomes good fortune for the rest of us. I'd also tell you that neither pussyfoots around, and they are straight talkers. And I'll give you a couple of quick excerpts from their books in illustration. So if you read Irvin Johnson's book of 
seven years ago, 32 Ways to Be a Champion in Business. You would read this, quote, I learned to face my fears and move past them on the basketball court and later in business as well. I'd feel a knot in my stomach before important presentation to investors or a negotiation with bankers. They were usually white and well-educated and far more experienced in business than I was. So my old fears would come welling up. Am I smart enough? Will I be able to get the words out? Will they take me seriously? And then he went on to say, I carried the baggage of a black man from a blue-collar family. We all have our insecurities. Luckily for me, my father pushed me out the door and taught me the fear of what might happen is often worse than the reality. Or you could read this excerpt from Mike's Just Out book, Humble by the Journey, Life Lessons for My Family and Yours. The prison for this book is Mike's 508 mile walk across the northern tier of Spain, a walk called El Camino for which he raised a boatload of money for a hospital and children facing premature mortality. And he says in the book, to quit that walk, quote, was a daily temptation, one that could have been easily based on the weather, the extreme heat, the extreme cold, the thick mist through most of the mountains where no one could barely see 50 feet ahead, the windy days. And then there were those darn small hand-posted signs tacked on fences and trees offering taxi services to the nearest city. Mike, of course, didn't quit, and quit, as far as I know, is not within his vocabulary. So we're going to build a conversation this evening on what they have in common, and I'm going to ask them a series of questions, and they will respond, and they'll take turns responding. And then when we get about an hour out, we've got a microphone there, and folks can line up and ask their questions. So the first question. It's about handouts. Urban Johnson writes, Dad didn't believe in handouts, so as a kid, the only way I could get my hands on any spending money was to go out and earn it. By the time I was 10, I had my own little neighborhood business, raking leaves, cleaning yards, shoveling snow. And in Mike's family, as his mother would attest, they didn't go much in for handouts either. In fact, Mike writes about his father not letting him accept the scholarship for, my, quote, minorities, unquote, at the famous Jesuit high school in New York called Xavier. And your dad instead made it clear, quote, you don't take charity. You have two arms and two legs. You get a job. You pay half the tuition, and I pay half the tuition. So for four years, Mike works every day of the week, all seven, weekdays cleaning cages of animals used in experiments at New York's psychiatric institution, and then on the weekends would sell plastic dinosaurs and other souvenirs at the American Museum of Natural History. So one of you start out here and tell us about the lessons here. Urban, are you willing to start? Okay, I'll, I'll definitely start. Um, First of all, I, I, I was blessed to have uh, both my parents who instilled their values in me and always pushed all of us in terms of education and also that anything in life we were going to get or receive, we had to work very hard for it. And they set the example. I saw my dad go to work for General Motors 30 years. My mother worked for the school cafeteria. So when you come from a family of 10, six sisters, three brothers, and you wanted to do something like go to the movies, you already knew the answer was going to be no. So coming from Michigan, it snowed a lot. So my dad said, I'm going to help you, though, even though I said no. I'm going to help you get the money so that you can go to the movie. There's the shovel, the rake, and the lawnmower. Go at it. So I went door to door and knocking on people's door, uh, 
I was praying for snowstorms all the time. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, in Michigan, we got a lot of them. And so I used to dig people out of their driveways. I used to shovel uh, snow and then also during the fall, rake leaves. And of course, in the summer, cut people's lawn. Uh, my father had another job, which was a trash hauling service. So we used to go by people's homes and pick up their trash. And um, this is what really turned my life around, this lesson here. So I would only work with him in the wintertime on Saturdays because I had to go to school. But on that Saturday, it was like a snow blizzard, and it was must have been 10 below zero in, in, in Lansing, Michigan. My job was to get outside the, outside the barrels and pick up all the loose trash. And so this day was so cold that I picked up just enough, threw it on the trash truck, and ran back in and jumped in the cabin. By the time I closed the door, he had grabbed me, <laughs> drug me back through the snow, and said, Irvin, if you do this job halfway, you're going to practice basketball halfway. You're going to do your, your homework halfway. He said, you have to do every job better than anybody else. So, so I became a perfectionist after that day. So everything I did after that was at the best level, highest level, and I owe all of that to my dad. So now, as I'm playing basketball, I became a perfectionist. I wanted to do everything the right way. And as a father, I want to be a father the right way, on and on and on. So I thank my dad for every life lesson. I, I, even today, he's my number one hero. You know, I admire him. I look up to him. And the only reason I'm sitting here today is because of both my mom and dad. I have her smile. <laughs> and so I want to save the world like her. And I'm, I'm, I'm tough and strong and a workaholic like my father. Mike. Uh, I, I like to first complain that he has a big mic and I have a little one. <laughs> I'm taller, I'm taller. I know, I know. So, so it's not only the 11 inches, but it's also the size of the mic. Uh, I love this guy. We met years ago, and there was an immediate connection, not only because of the, the smile that he has, but the heart that he has. He's an incredible man. He is a wonderful father, wonderful husband. Under definition for commitment and hard work, his picture should be in the dictionary. There's a lot that I admire about my good friend, Irvin. And we have a lot in common. My mother is here today, sitting right, in, right up here. And mom, this is my, my brother from the same mother. Uh, <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> and I will tell you that, very similar to, to Irvin's story, my, my mom and dad were very demanding. Uh, from very early on. Everything had to be earned. There was not a handout. Everything had to be earned. My sister is here today. She is the Mother Teresa of animals. So if you want to get rid of a cat, put her at a 95, she will find that cat. A dog, a kangaroo, she will find it. The lessons that I learned from my dad are the lessons that many families learn that are first-generation immigrants to this country. Whether you're a person of Jewish faith, whether you're a Cuban, whether you're a Mexican, Irish, Pat, you're not here? No, he's not here. We all have this immigrant mentality that we have to prove ourselves. We are new to this country, and we have to work harder. My father, when he said to me, you cannot take this scholarship, remember what he said, and he qualified it. He said, you have two arms and two legs. It's not that he did not believe in charity, but he did believe that if you were a capable human being, you had to carry your own weight. Now, 
they're also very charitable people. And we as kids and all of you, we learn from what we see, not what we hear. And I saw them giving when we didn't have. In Cuba, in our small home, uh, above a bottle storage warehouse, there was always somebody coming for something my mom would give to them, something my, 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 some, a cake that my mom would bake for them, uh, a shirt that she would give to them. And one day, we went from being the givers to being the receivers. When we got here from the small little town in Cuba to New York City, I hated the cold weather. You know, Constance and Irvin are both from Michigan. You guys somehow are sick with, <laughs> you love cold weather. <laughs> I hated the cold weather. So we were the recipients of the generosity of many who gave us their coats. The first coat that I had was given to me by a Mexican family who lived in our building. The first job that my father had was given to him by a Jewish man who said to him, I used to be in your shoes at one time. So it was a very demanding relationship, but it was one of utmost respect. He had a job, he had two jobs within two weeks of being in this country, doing short order cook work on Wall Street from five till 9 a.m. and serving tables at Kennedy International Airport as a bartender working strictly on tips. He came home and he said, son, there are opportunities all around us. All you have to do is open your eyes and take actions. If you don't take action, opportunities are going to pass you by all your life. So they were a great role model of how to be, um, how to stand on your own two feet. At the same time, how to take care of others. Um, they were the core of who I am today. Between my father and my mother, my family, uh, a priest that became uh, a mentor to me, uh, and always insisted. You gotta take care of those who come after you. Those are the values that I learned as a kid from my parents. So these are immensely, <laughs> so these are immensely successful people, but I wanna turn to failure and what the lessons might be, what lessons they might see. Irvin, if I read right, you had a television talk show that lasted just eight weeks. And if I read right again, your first post-NBA business was selling sportswear, and no one pointed it out as a success. And you wrote, quote, nothing humbled me as much as failing at that first business. And Mike, you were to be charitable at best a C student in high school. You crashed your first car, I wouldn't mention this, but you crashed your second car as well. <laughs> you failed at your second business and had to move in with your parents for three years. And you write in your book, quote, we lost lots of money in lots of businesses before we got it right. And so each of you became fabulously successful in business after business, enterprise after enterprise. But maybe, Mike, you can start here and talk about what you learned from your failures and your mistakes. I, I would say that I never learned anything from my success. Uh, success can actually be damaging to you if you start believing your own PR and what people tell you, especially if you had enjoyed a certain level of success. Everything that I've learned that is of value, I've learned from my failures, and I've had my share of them. When I failed in business early on, and, and it was a humbling experience, like, look, I, I served in the Army for three years. I jumped out of airplane 47 times. My salary was uh, $287 per month, plus $25 for what they call hazardous duty pay. Uh, so I knew my life was not that expensive. It was $25 a month. Uh, <laughs> And I am all of a sudden in Miami, a new city. My parents had moved from New York to Miami while I was in the service. And you, I had no network, I had no friends here, and I needed a job, so I became a door-to-door -door salesman. 
I knocked on every door in Fountain Blue Park, on Flagler and 87th Avenue, off the expressway, for a whole week and did not get one single sale. And after one week, and literally hundreds of doors and rejection, you learn, it's, it's, I'm unemployed every single day as a salesman. But I focus on the fact, not that I was unemployed, is that whether I made money and how much I made depended on my ability to stay active and move forward. So I had the limitation that I had a $500 salary, which by the way, to most, it was a very small salary. To me, it was double what I was making in the Army. So it was a blessing. And my gosh, I've got, died and gone to heaven. I'm making $500 a month. But I could make whatever I wanted to make by just working harder than my competitors, by, than my peers. Failure, I found, was a necessary companion on the road to success. If you succeed and you haven't failed, then gosh, it came too easy to you and it's a shame that you, you did not face the joy that I used to get out of overcoming a failure. And my gosh, you know, I, I was introduced by, by one of the business groups in Miami about a year ago for, for from some recognition and they went through a list of every company that I have built, of which we just sold our number 25th company uh, in the last month or so. And, and, and I, when I got up on stage to accept the, uh, the, the award, uh, I said, you know, this is very unfair. Let me read to you everything that I failed at. Because I don't want anybody in the audience to think that I've, because I've, I've heard that comments from time to time. My gosh, uh, everything you touch, it does, does well. No. I have fallen so many times, and I've been humbled so many times, but you couldn't keep me down. You couldn't keep me down because of the experience that I had. I have a mother and father that, like many of yours, whether it was Eastern Europe, whether it was the Caribbean, whether it was China or Cuba, they left everything behind in order to dream for us. They gave it all for us so we can live in a democracy, so we can enjoy freedom, so we could vote. So we would have the right to fail as many times as we had to fail, but we could get up as many times as we had the internal fortitude to stand up for. So failure, to me, was a fantastic teacher. I can make it as simple as that. I used to hammer a piece of plywood, and I remember hammering maybe 100 nails. I don't know how fast it went, but I will tell you, the one time that I missed the nail, and I hit my thumb. I can tell you today, I know at what angle that nail was at, at what speed the hammer was flying at, and how much it hurt. It was a learning experience. So if you haven't failed, try it. It's a wonderful, humbling experience. <laughs> How do you come behind that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that uh, everybody thought the platform that the NBA had been, had given me and that the success, the success of the Lakers would make it easy for me to become a businessman. And um, that was uh, not the truth. My first business, I can remember like it was yesterday, I thought that, uh, okay, I'm a smart basketball player. I think I could be a smart businessman, so I'm gonna open this store up and uh, sell everybody's jerseys, inclu including my own, and football jerseys and basketball jerseys. And I went to the Super Show in Chicago, because that's where you had to go to, to buy all the jerseys. And uh, I went there and picked out thousands of items and I put them into the store and as you said Tom for months nobody bought anything because I bought everything that I like and I didn't buy anything that the customers like <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was my rude awakening to business and that let me know that I was not an expert buyer that I had to hire a buyer, and that cost me about two, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars. And um, 
and always make your business about the customer. And ever since that day, my whole mission in life is to over deliver to my customers and to the community. And you have to fail to understand that, well, I take that back. From failing, you understand why you failed. Make sure you just don't make those mistakes again. But as Mike said, you get right back up and you still become a risk taker. Um, my greatest joy was being knocked down from that business failing and getting back up and then being successful. And another part of that I would say too is my greatest competitor, probably Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, made me a better basketball player and a better man. And the reason why is the fear that I could lose to them. And so <clears throat> it's very important that we understand that I lost to the Celtics, to my arch rival Larry Bird in 84. And that was the hardest thing I had to overcome. Not just the business failing, but also how do I come back from losing to Larry Bird in 84. I cried all summer, but it also made me go to the gym every day all summer. And God has a way of putting you in a position to, to let you be successful. So in 85, we played the Celtics again. But what I didn't tell you, in 84, I caused us to lose the championship. For the first time in my life, I made mistakes in crucial moments. I had won every championship I had ever been involved in, except that one. And so I failed, and it made me realize I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And I could improve, and that's what Mike was just talking about. So I went, had to go back to the drawing board and improve and get better. And sure enough, in 85, we played them again, and I didn't make those same mistakes, and we won. So for me, I failed in sports, and I failed in business, but I, I learned from those mistakes that I made, got right back up, and hopefully have been successful. So, and also, they can humble you and keep your eye on the prize, too. And God lets you know that, okay, I may bless you with something, but I can take it away just as fast. So we have to remember that, too. So picking up exactly where Irvin Johnson is and just said, he writes in one of his books about the power of humility. You say, knowing it all means you never learn much. Knowing it all means you never learn much. And Mike, in your book, you write about never going to board or staff meetings. Instead, true story, you might be checking bathroom cleanliness in this country's largest chain of Hispanic-owned pharmacies that you ultimately sold a few months ago to the giant CVS. And then you say, quote, if they're dirty, the managers aren't doing their jobs. So talk to us, both of you, about humility. Maybe start with you, Mike. The lessons of humility and how you spend your time. Uh, the book talks about this. For instance, Mike never sits at the head of the table in any meeting, quite deliberately. Uh, how do you behave in a way that others, I see George there, others are <laughs> encouraged and inspired. Well, let me, probably let me start because okay. it's his book. You're so the biggest he's, guy around. He's the man. <laughs> start when you want. <laughs> because I got to give him more time. <laughs> see, if you want to lead people, you have to be led too. You have to be willing to be led by somebody. Both Mike and I don't pretend we know it all. We hire the right people, people who are smarter than ourselves. 
we don't micromanage those people as well. We allow them to do their job. And also, too, those same people, as well as others, teach us things as well. Every day I learn something. I've learned so much from this man. He's, I tell him God sent him and put him in my life for a reason. He's an angel. He's, he's been such a true blessing, such a true leader, such a, a man who cares about the community more than he cares about himself. And he wants to touch that community in such an incredible way. It's, his legacy will not be about the 25 companies that he started and built. It's going to be about how many lives he touches and, and puts in college and, and, and open doors for. And that's what it's got to be about. So for me, I'm so blessed because I, I understand that I've been put in this situation for a reason. African Americans have, we needed a role model to so, show us that we can start and own a bill business. We can put people to work in our own community. We can, um, we can rally the people around a common goal and, 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 and what's good for the community. And what I try to do is make sure I deliver messages to the community that is important to them that will affect them and their family in, in a good way. So I'm glad that I play the role that I play, but always understand this. I'm learning and I will also, I'm willing to be led by those who want to lead me too. I can also fall in line. And so I think that's what it's all about. And, um, and that's, who, that's what to me makes a great leader. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Mike because I might start crying up here. <laughs> because I love the man so much. And mom, I wanna tell you something. You have done a tremendous job. He talks about you and dad all the time, and I think that the torch that he's carrying comes from both of you. And also about you know, his country growing up there. He tells me great stories. And so uh, this man is a special man. You know, we, we try to, I try to align myself with special people from here, don't have to be here, but from here. And he's got both, he's got this and he has this. So he's blessed. Sir, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, you're allowed to cry a little if you want instead of uh, Irvin. Uh, as you can tell, this is a mutual admiration society that we have going on here. Uh, Humility to me comes from gratitude. It is is it's recognizing our limitations. You know, I I am look. I, I am a college dropout. I was a average student at best. I was told that I should have been a fireman or a policeman because I needed a very structured environment where I had to be told what to do. Had I followed that guidance counselor's, counselor's advice, I, mean, I, I don't think I would be here today. But because of my ADD, I forgot his advice five minutes after he gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody told me that I wasn't supposed to be here. So sometimes not knowing your own limitations is a blessing in, in disguise. I was never told there's a ceiling that stops you. Uh, the first job I had in Miami as a salesman, the gentleman who interviewed me for that job did not want me to get that job. And he basically gave me literally a five minute training class, handed me a life insurance sales book, opened it up and said on the right page, top right hand corner you have the age of the person, Right page is the male, the left hand page is the female. If you go down this column, you will see how much per thousands of life insurance you're gonna sell, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 100,000, whatever the, a million, whatever the amount is. And then you multiply those numbers at the bottom where they don't want the premium to be sold. It's gonna be where they wanna pay the premiums, either monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or annual. Here's some applications. You can do it, son. That's your training class. 
get out the door? Well, he told me that in order to qualify to be a salesman, I needed to sell $52,000 in premium. I did not know at the time what that meant. So I have a stack of applications, I have a book on how to read the, 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 the rates and how to adjust it. I don't have any friends or families that who can buy. I think my father bought a $15,000 policy for $12 a month, and uh, Cesar Alvarez, I think you brought one that for a little higher than that. Uh, Tony Argis, thank you, we still have your policy in place. <laughs> <laughs> and I come back two months later, and I have over $60,000 in checks. So I come into the door, and I have a box of checks and a box of applications, and I give it to Mr. Hughes, and his, the look that he gave me was like, I had to ask, did I, did, did I do something wrong? And he said, no, no, st stay here. Let me call Mr. Phillips, who's the agency manager for a second. Comes, brings Mr. Phillips in, tells him the story. I met this young man two, two months ago. He went out and he sold $60,000 worth of premium. What they didn't tell me, that if you sold $52,000 in annual premium for this insurance company, you were in what they call the National Leaders Court, which is the top one quarter of 1%. <laughs> no one told me I was not supposed to do that. So I went out and, and, and I did it. I am humbled by, by the fact that when I worked at that museum on weekends in New York City and Central Park West, as you come in through the front entrance and it's there today, there's a quote on the left-hand side that says, Keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. Teddy Roosevelt. To me, it doesn't mean that if you reach for the stars, you have to become irrelevant. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, don't have to become, you don't have to become egotistical. You can stay grounded. To me, I have more respect for a waiter serving dinner or lunch at a restaurant, then possibly, I've walked out of lunch meetings where the big shot was discourteous to the waiter. And I said, look, I just don't have time for you. And I did that when I was broke, by the way. I didn't wait until I had two, two pennies to rub together. So humility is a form of gratitude. And think, I thank God that I've been given the common sense to be very grateful by knowing my own limitations. Okay, let's, uh, so here's another business-related question, but it would apply to any of us and all of us, and it, it involves taking risk. And Urban, you write, quote, smart entrepreneurs don't avoid risk, they manage them, and then you say managing risk is a fine art, you never want to take unnecessary risk, but you don't want to miss out on opportunities due to quote, paralysis by analysis either. And then Mike, you touched on this earlier, but in your book you talk a lot about taking risk, including jumping out of airplanes with the 82nd Airborne, but one of the things you'll read in the book, which he didn't mention here, is that on one occasion the main chute doesn't open, and the reserve chute open 300 feet above the ground meaning you end up with significantly smashed ankles and some consequences for the rest of your life. And so, Irvin, start out, what's your advice on managing risk knowing that sometimes it just doesn't work out? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, I'm blessed to have, you know, a, a good partner in Eric Holloman, and to, he's here somewhere. And, and I think that what we do is try to vet the deal and we, we make sure that it's the right deal, not only for our company, but for our brand. Uh, also, who's leading the effort and what do they stand for? So it's important that, like when Mike and I came together, uh, who was Mike Fernandez? What did, what did he stand for? What is he about? What, is, what are his values? Do my values, values, and his values align with one another? Because to me, it's not just all about making money. You know, I want to make a difference in the community too. And that's why 
we were able to come together. Um, but once I feel good about the deal, is there risk involved? Of course, in every deal that we do, there's going to be risk involved. But we want to mitigate those risks. But once we vet it, I ask Eric, what did he think? He comes back and give me his opinion of the deal. And then I go back and marinate on it. And I usually come up on with the answer when I'm running on the treadmill. And if I'm running on the treadmill and it comes to me that we should do it, we do it. If I'm running on the treadmill and I got a look on my face like yeah. it's not going to work, then we don't do it. And so, uh, but I'm a risk taker. That's what I am. I'm, I'm an aggressive businessman. I like, I like that. Uh, it comes from our background. It comes from being poor. It comes from, but I'm also, I feel, a smart businessman and more common sense than book sense. So I got great common sense. And so when Mike approached me with this deal and he had sold already 24 companies, common sense said, be in business with Mike Fernandez. <laughs> so I'm not a stupid guy at all. Uh, and now he's 25 for 25 and him and I are one for one. So I wanna tell people out there Business is not just about the numbers, too, and, 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 and the book sense and the book smarts. It's also about great common sense and also put you a team around you to help you. And with Eric on my team and others, we were able to really, uh, I, I think, minimize the risk and put ourselves in a position to win. And so far, knock on some wood, and we've been blessed to win. Mike. Uh. <laughs> Very similar. Uh, m my Eric is George Rico, who, who is here, uh, and <laughs> great guy. And I am surrounded by very talented people who help me manage that risk. You know, life is like life is a is walking like through a minefield. All it takes is one step. And you don't know if that minefield is going to blow up on you. So you got to figure out how do you minimize that risk. You, you do due diligence. Uh, you, um, you, you protect, you buy insurance. And look, if you're, if you're young, you have a family, you buy life insurance. Uh, if, if, if you're about to get married, don't shoot me, you get a prenup. You have to manage the risk. <laughs> you have to manage the risk, no matter what it is. And, and it can be effectively managed. I am not a gambler. Someone asked me years ago, he says, what do you mean you don't gamble? You bet whether people get sick or not in health insurance. I said, you know, I'm not betting. I'm, I'm, I am managing. Uh, and and it, it's a business with, with a margin of 2 or 3%. So when you have, you know, in this current business that we own today, four years ago, it had $38 million in sales. This year has $1.4 billion. On a 3% margin, if you get something wrong, you could be upside down in a second. So you got to manage every detail, and the answer is in the detail. A lot of people focus on their dream. This is where I want to be, but you got to focus on the detail. David talked about me going to bathrooms uh, and checking whether the bathroom was clean or not. Was there, was there a toilet paper there? Were there urine spots on the floor? was the sink clean. I didn't have to go to a management meeting. That told me if that manager was running a good shop or not. If I listened to my customer service calls, which I still do today for 20 minutes a week, that tells me more about the company simply than, than going to a management meeting where a lot of people in that management meeting want to tell me what I want to hear or want to tell me something that pumps them up. So I'd rather just do what nobody else wants to do, which is the little stuff. And if I found that if you focus on the micro stuff, the macro will kind of deliver itself. And you just have to manage it. Every little bit of business is a risk, the same way as every part of life is a risk. Both um, of us, I'm sorry, I'm no. sorry. Both of us are control freaks. We like to control <laughs> it. No, 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 don't. don't. We're not apologizing for that <laughs> because that's why we're where we are today. And 
that's what he was talking about, the details. And I've been working with this man for three or four years, and I've seen him at his best just going over the details. And that's what it's all about. And it doesn't matter once he built company number 26, he's going to be hands-on, fully involved, want to know everything, and I'm the same way. And, um, and we're just built like that. And I, so I think that's a, a beautiful and wonderful trait to have. If, if I may add something to what you said earlier, which is your answers come on the treadmill. We all have intuition. Uh, and yours come on a treadmill because you're an athlete. I am the most out of shape guy that I know. Uh, so I, I follow my intuition closely. There, there is, for example, I've never been bitten by a snake, but I recoil when I see one. That is a million years of evolution. So if you have a gut feeling about something, do not ignore it. Listen to it. Because you can go into a room and somebody can bring you uh, the application of some big shot executives and the guy has a PhD, was a company A, B, C, D, graduated from Yale, Harvard, and you meet him for 10 minutes and there's a feeling there that is not right, walk away. Don't do it. Stop rationalizing. Just don't do it. And, and also to that, that next part of that, don't worry about how it, the outcome came out. So even if the business went and it exploded, you can't worry about that because your gut is the only thing you have. I know I passed on deals, and I'm glad I did, that intuition what he was talking about. Then there's deals I might have passed on that went on to do very well, but it didn't matter to me. In, in my heart, with my brand, with my company, we just didn't align, and I stuck to my guns. Always stick to your guns. That's very important. So both of you, uh have talked this evening about the importance of people. And Irvin, you write, quote, I don't hire people to work for my company. I hire them to be my company. My business, any business, goes only where its employees take it. And then you write later, how you treat people always matters. And Mike, you write, never forget that you never build anything by yourself. Share the credit, share the wealth. So how do each of you show people how you appreciate them? I think I treat them like I want to be treated. I treat them like family. And, you know, we both share in the fact that to get to the end game, we all have to come together and play a role to get us there. Not me getting us there, but us getting us there and we getting us there. And so it's really important that, um, just like I played basketball, I was the point guard, and I used to love to come down the middle. And since Ray Allen is here, let's give a hand to Ray Allen. Yeah. So my Ray Allen was Byron Scott. And I always knew Byron would fade to the corner for the three-point shot. On the left-hand side, I would have James Worthy. He would come in and swoop in with the big hand and finger roll, oh, so sweet. <laughs> Kurt Rambis would come barreling down. Remember, he had the black glasses on. And he would be coming real fast. But I knew I couldn't throw it to Kurt until he came to a complete stop because he would travel every single time. <laughs> A.C. Green would run so fast, well, you know, A.C. would just say, hey, don't throw it to me, I'm just gonna go for the offensive rebound. Kareem would throw it to me and say, huh, go down, if Byron don't shoot the jumper, James don't dunk it, Kurt don't dunk it, then I'll come down and shoot the sky hook. So what am I telling you? You gotta know your employees and you gotta know the people that you work with. You got to know the strength and weaknesses of those people. But again, we all play a role to make the company successful. Just like we all played a role, Ray Allen, and if he doesn't hit that big shot, then Miami don't win that championship. But also, <laughs> hmm. 
But also, Chris Bosh got the rebound, has the presence of mind to do what? Throw it to Ray. You know, it, so everybody helped. LeBron helped. Dwayne Wade helped. On and on and on. They all helped. So that's what happens even in business. We all have a role. We all play a role. I was blessed to be with Mike. I played my role. I was the face. <laughs> we had an incredible team that's here. A lot of those people are here today who uh, was out selling, was out making sure the managers were doing their job, on and on and on. And so another friend of Mike and I, he's here, uh, who hit more home runs almost than anybody. Alex Rodriguez, please <laughs> say hello to... And we're looking forward to him coming back this season. So, uh, A-Rod. So, sir, I'm going to pass the ball. No look. <laughs> <laughs> and you can take it from or, or, Unfortunately, I'm not an athlete, but if I had a, a, a team to play, my, my son, Michael, is, is an avid basketball player and, and is a walk-on at UM. And sometimes I'm totally out of sync with sports. So sometimes when he used to come to the house, and, and, and see Ray at the house, and see uh, Jimmy Jones at the house, and, and see you at the house, and, and see A-Rod at the house. He goes, how the hell do you do this? <laughs> and you don't even love sports. <laughs> and I, 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 and I, I think, let me tell you, I think A-Rod is one of the best bowlers in the country. He can bowl, is it ball or is it uh, baseball? Baseball, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> When, when, I, I remember when Ray and I first met, uh, when he first moved to Miami, him and Shannon and the kids. My gosh, you know, they were in our pool, you know, great relationships. I was not a significant player in, in, my, in my companies. My, my business was to identify an opportunity, and sometimes it was just to find out the detail. When we thought about getting into the HIV business, for example, it, it was a niche that no one else got into it, and it wasn't my idea. It was Peter's idea. And Peter works for Yamil. <laughs> so, you know, Peter is, is brilliant. And, and then Dr. Cowley over there, she's brilliant. And George works out the numbers and makes sure everything works out. And I am the dumbest guy in a room. Honestly, these guys are brilliant. And I learn from them every day. I love when they challenge me. I love when they... They said, you know, you're wrong, uh, and, and in many cases, most cases, they are right and I am wrong. So surrounding myself and not being embarrassed by the fact that they're smarter than you are, it's a very smart thing to do. But also, too, not the fact that we both are wrong, but explaining to us why we're wrong and then providing a better solution. That's the key. And so I love to learn. That's what I want. I want to learn. So if I suggest this and that, then if it's bad, then tell me why, and then, okay, give me a better idea or give me a better way it can work, and that's all I want. So the both of us want that. Mike, you've also been, as you've sold companies, you've been very generous to your own employees. And you talk about a credo of share the credit and share the wealth. Give people a sense of that. I, again, uh, uh, th this particular company that we're partners in, when we, when we bought it four years ago, had $38 million in revenue, so it was losing $1.5 million per month. It had 40 employees. Today, that company has close to 1,000 employees in between Miami and Tampa, most of them in, in Coral Gables. Uh, $1.4 billion of revenues, $70 million a year in, in, in earnings. And it doesn't happen because of me. It doesn't happen because of Peter, George, Dr. Cowley, Thomas, Carlos, my son George. It doesn't happen. It happens because of everyone. It happens because of the receptionist that always has a smile on her face. When, when regardless, uh, you know, she's the face of the company. When somebody comes to see you, that's who they see. It happens because the claims person who's very polite to, to, to the person who's calling you, and if you're in the insurance business, when somebody calls you, they're not calling you to let you know you're doing a great job. They're calling you because they have a problem, and normally it's their health. So you gotta put yourself into, into their shoes. So part of the culture where we have excelled at in building great companies 
is build that sense of caring. Going back to Irvin's point, treat others as you would want to be treated. And when you compare the companies that we have sold companies to, what they had or what they lacked was what we had. We had a soul. We had a culture that was committed to service. And, and, and those companies did extremely well because they had people that, that care about them. So when we sold uh, you know, Care Plus a few years ago, uh, I, I think it was uh, between management and non-management employee, including receptionists and file clerks and, and, and claims manager, I, I think we gave them $90 million to, to those employees because it's not us. So I want to ask a couple more questions and then we'll begin letting the audience participate in all of this. Uh, one of the questions is, has to do with a changing America and the opportunity thereof. And Irvin, in one of your books, I read this, my partners and I have proven that investing in minority communities makes financial sense. And Mike, I've heard you talk over and over again profoundly about your passion on the changing demographics in our countries and in our country and how slow business are, are to understand those changes and how you think there is enormous opportunity. You and I live in a country where already more children of color are born than otherwise and by the end of this decade there will be more children of color, period than otherwise, and a bunch of you, but not me, will be living when what we call minorities in this country will be in the majority. It's several decades away, but it is absolutely coming. And I want you both to talk about the opportunity you see now and the opportunity in the future. Well, I think that <clears throat> if corporate America wants to grow, their bottom line. They have to reach out to minorities. They have to invest in minority communities now. The suburbs are just about built out. What the number is what, seven to one, six to one, I think, uh, in terms of uh, uh, minorities, in terms of uh, being born to other uh, demographics. And so I think it's like six, seven to one. And then when you think about the spending power of minorities, it, says it keeps going up and up and up. So <clears throat> when you think about opportunity and where the opportunity is, is, is in the minority communities. Um, and what we have to do as minorities is continue to push education to our kids, uh, continue to also uh, become small business owners and put in our communities and put our people to work first, train them to do their job, and then put them to work. And I was saying earlier how the problem in the African American community is the dollar doesn't recycle. It doesn't pass through a lot of hands because we don't own enough businesses in our community. Most of the time, people outside our community own the businesses so they take the money to their community. And if we have more small business owners in our community, the community will be able to grow. So I'm hoping in the next decade that will happen to four African Americans, four Latinos to grow their wealth base. And that's going to be very important. Um, the future is about what you just talked about. And um, we got to continue to, um, I think, push our leaders to do a better job. And um, to me, that's what it's all about, wealth building in the next decade. How can we build wealth? Mike, I'm going to preface. I, I want you to get into the subject a bit about, frankly, the nativist anti immigration media and feelings and frequently hatred in this country. Uh, 
that's so easily visible and why that is so egregiously stupid for the United States of America to have those attitudes. I know how strongly you feel about that. Well, it, it, it is, there's not a perfect country, but we by far live in the best country in the world. There's none better, and there's room for improvement, and we have to move in that direction. If we look at the current demographics and the trends in those demographics, today, as we speak today, 20% of all children in playgrounds have a Hispanic surname today. 2020, it's not 30 years from now, 2020, according to the Census Bureau, 95% of all teenagers will have a Hispanic surname. A raft arrived last week behind my house, and it bounced off my seawall, and it went to my neighbor's house. And I don't think it was picked up by the paper, but there, was, there were Cuban rafters who were there, and they were picked up by another boat and taken over to Matheson Hammock or, or somewhere. These people did not put their life at risk, nor their children's, nor their wife, because they're lazy. These people left because they aspire for something greater. These are not lazy people. Whether they come on a raft of my seawall or they cross the border of Mexico, or come down from Canada, think about the Hispanic population in this country. There are more Hispanics in the US than there are Canadians in Canada. If you look at the Hispanic buying power in this country, it's the seventh largest economy in the world. We cannot shut our eyes and say, send them back. You're gonna separate a mother that came here and risked it all to, to pluck chicken feathers in o Omaha and has a son who's now Native American born. Are you going to separate them and take the mother back and send 18 million people out of this country? We're not going to do that. That's not what America is all about. These are risk takers. These are the future. Our retirement, who's going to fund it? All you have to do is look at Europe. They can't, they can't fund their retirement plans. Somebody has to pay our retirement plans. And that is the type of population that instead of fighting it, we got to embrace them because they are the future taxpayers. You know, why should they pay a different tuition uh, than uh, to go to a university? Now, I know that changed last year than someone who was born here just because they came here when they were three years old. We required them to pay, th we used to require them to pay three times the going rate for, for, a, for a college degree. We condemned that person to a job at minimum wage. So help them, what we should be doing is mainstreaming these people so they become taxpayers, they become homeowners, they become contributors to social security, they become contributors to our retirement plans because that is the future. You know, there is, uh, you know, there's an old, joke that I heard, and that is the Mayflower was arriving uh, into, into, uh, into this new territory called Americas, and there are two Native Americans sitting on a rock, and the two Native Americans see the Mayflower coming, and they look at each other, and they said, here come the boat people. <laughs> <laughs> well, this country is changing. Business and corporate has to embrace it. To be Hispanic in my business, or any business, it's like having someone in the financial market on a Friday know where the stock market is gonna be at on Monday. We know what that customer wants. We know what they wanna buy. I had this conversation in, 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 in Norman's office, uh, dear friend Norm Brayman, who has been such a wonderful supporter of every group that has come to Miami. Uh, and, and, and one of the comments that I've, that I've made is, in that meeting was, you know, imagine leaving Israel and going to Australia, and you know there are 17 million 
men and women of Jewish faith that are going to be coming to Australia, and you're one of the first there. You know what color they like? You know they like bagel? You know they like cream cheese and lox? You know what they want. So for companies in the U.S. to bring in minorities is very important because we are, whether some people want it or not, the future. Now, in Miami, we live in a bubble because we have such a, an important group that has done very well and you open, you go to the opera here, or you go to the Philharmonic, and you go to Adrian uh, 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 Harsh Center, and, and gosh, you know, we see Rafael Kravik, and we see Norman Brayman, and, and we see Cesar Alvarez, but you go outside of Miami, and you are in San Antonio, Texas, and you are in Pueblo, Colorado, you know, we're not the majority, but we will be, and our buying power it's good business to open ourselves up. By the way, it's good business for us Cuban Americans to change. And please forgive me for saying this. We say, well, in Cuba, we were never prejudiced. Uh, you know, guys, I haven't been to a Cuban restaurant in Miami that there's an African American waiter in it. Name one. We had to embrace it. We, we are together in this, and as my brother here and I have managed to work together, you know, when we talk in, at home about setting up a scholarship program for first time, individuals, children who want to go to college, we're not saying this is for Hispanics. We're saying this is for anyone who needs it. Yeah. We are one. My son dates an African-American young woman. She's family. So should all we be family? You want to say something? No, 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 no. He he covered it. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask one last question, which is of a more personal nature, but something that all of us are challenged by. This is the balancing act of work and family, and both of the speakers spent year after year after year working and working and working and getting ahead. And in both your sets of books, you write of sometimes neglected families. So I want to know what your wake-up call was and what did you learn and what's your advice for all of us and what do you want your children to learn from you? Wow. Well, I think for me, in the beginning, balance was hard. I'm so competitive. Um, I hate to lose at anything. You know, my wife encouraged me to play my daughter one-on-one. -on -one. She used to be a basketball player. And um, I told her no so many times, and then she kept pushing me to play her. And I said, okay, we go to 10. I, I, it was hard for me, but I let her get to nine. I really did. And then I had to crush her, you know, and so, <laughs> because I don't care who I'm playing against. I'm sorry, mom, don't take offense to this. But if I was playing my mother, I would have to crush her too, mom. But I'm just a competitive guy and I love to win. And what my dad instilled in me, I, I still have it. I'm, I'm just a worker. I get my greatest pleasure out of serving the Lord, my wife Cookie, my three children, my two grandchildren, and working. I don't play golf, I don't have hobbies, I love to work. And so, the wake up call was, here's my best friend who has been my biggest supporter. Uh, and I think, for me, it was announcing HIV 23 years ago. My wife, I told her she could leave me if she wanted to. So when she decided to stay with me and said, we're going to beat this together, right then I had to change. And not just dealing with HIV, but also 
how can I make our relationship stronger, better? And um, so I had to cut back just a little bit, even though I'm still a worker. But now having the date nights on the weekend, we go to the movies all the time or concerts, things that we enjoy, making sure we get away to our beach home or, or to somewhere around water because we both love water. And um, I finally realized I can't take it all with me, right? And that I want to grow old with her. And um, so I think that we now have a good balance of I'm still working as hard as ever, but also I want to also make sure our relationship stays strong. What I want my kids to take away from me, first of all, I want them to understand that um, it took hard work to get to this position where we are in life. I, of, course, of course I'm going to spoil them, and I do, but I just don't want them to feel like they're entitled. And that's a, it's, that's a, a, a balance that we all have to have because I want them to still understand they got to go out and work one day. I've seen a lot of fathers or, 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 or mothers be successful and pass on the business to the kids. And guess what? They were not ready or prepared and the business failed. Because we didn't prepare them. We didn't make sure they went to work every day. And so it's important for me to point that out to my three kids and also get them to working too. Say, hey, you gotta work, you gotta come in, you gotta understand what, what this is all about. But we want better for our kids, both Mike and I, but it's a, it's a balancing act. And at the end of the day, I just want them to understand that we also gotta give back. You gotta inspire and touch other people. And so that's why all our efforts, we include our kids on our foundation efforts to help them understand that you got to give back, you got to help people. And that's it. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Mike. I've, I've had my share of mistakes. Uh, you know, like you know, my, my partner George, my, my, my partner Marcio, uh, Peter, they have been able to, to grow businesses and do well and keep the families together. I've, I've experienced two divorces because my passion was my work. Uh, I was gone all the time. Uh, whether it was, it was going to um, go to a baseball game for, for, with the kids or work, I chose work. Uh, it, it, was, it was not, uh, in, in retrospect, and I actually have, I have thought about it a great deal because I've had some health challenges. I've, I've had you know, heart attack when I was 50, I had one at 52, I had cancer at 59, I'm 62 now. And you thought about it, I think about it, and I look back, and yeah, I should have been more moderate, but I'm not sure I'm wired that way. I am wired the way that I am wired. Uh, and maybe I have failed being a good husband, I don't think I have failed being a good father. Uh, and, and to me, and even when Constance and I met, uh, and, and I thought she was going to, in my mind was, okay, I'm going to say something that she's going to fire me. She's going to get rid of me. And I said, you have to understand my kids always come first. And she said, I like you more because of that. So 16 years later, I found the person that understands business, understands me. If, if there's a, a function at the house and... Uh, you know, there's 18 att attorney generals at the house for a cocktail and I need to leave for, to fly out of town. Perfectly comfortable that she can handle it. So it's a great business partner, a great family partner. We have a, she's a great stepmom. She's a great mom to our son, Christopher. And, uh, you know, it took me a long time uh, uh, to find the, the, the right person and some mistakes. I have a good relationship with my, with my, uh, with, with my, uh, my ex-wives. Uh, I love my kids. My daughter lives with me. My sons have lived with me uh, until they got old enough and just got tired of me. Uh, but but uh, uh, I haven't been perfect in, in that area, and I could have done better. Uh, I'm just not sure how much better I could have done it in retrospect. Well, you, well, you <laughs> 
something had to sacrifice. Something, something had to give for us to get to this position. Something had to. And thank God I'm like you with Cookie. She understood what, what I was going for, but it, it was for us. It wasn't for me. It was for us. And I think that she gave me that rope to go, go, go. I take care of the kids. I got it. And, um, and it's great. And now we sit around on a lawn chair and laugh about <laughs> all those times. And, and I think now for both of us, we still work harder, but we work smarter too at the same time. So I, I feel particularly good tonight because my wife of 51 years is here and you have validated <laughs> being, you have validated being a control freak and a driven idiot. So apparently it's all right to be that, right? <laughs> so we're going to take some time. This has been a sensational program. Don't you all think? We're going to take some time for people in the audience to ask questions. We have a stand-up mic in the center aisle over here. Uh, you're going to line up, and if you keep your questions short, mm -hmm. you'll get short answers. <laughs> but if you keep them long, what's going to happen is fewer people are going to get to participate, and that's not really yeah. fair to anyone. And while you're lining up, I'm going to ask one person who's been in the audience to step up to the mic for two minutes. And that's Jack Roslowski, who's the president of Xavier High in New York, this fabled school where Mike went and a particular priest, the head of the school, beyond Mike's mother and father, was the formative influence in his life. And this is a school that Justice Scalia went to. This is a school that Al Roker went to. This is a school that Mike Fernandez went to. Jack Rosowski is the 33rd president of Xavier. He walked with Mike part of those 508 miles, and he wants to share his thoughts quickly. Jack? David, I noticed that quickly was in there three times. I'll <laughs> follow orders as instructed. Thank you. The, it was six years ago that I was named president of Xavier. The first, uh, first thing I did is I sought out that guidance counselor that told Mike he should be a fireman, and I fired him. <laughs> Most important thing I do as president, really, is to thank people for making the work of Xavier possible. I think tonight, in, in some ways, my thanks to Irvin and to Mike are really all our thanks, and it's an honor for me to be here. It's an old Quaker admonition to let your life speak. Tonight, Mike, Irvin, and Dave, we have three men who have let their lives speak in abundance, and the world's a better place. My days with Mike on the Camino were really days of blessing and days of stories of Cuba and Miami, of Constance and Michael and Michelle and Alexander and George, of siblings and parents, of New York, of Xavier, and a host of topics, some ridiculous, others sublime. The late Father Andrew Greeley, distinguished sociologist and writer himself, was once asked why he thought people came to church. He replied, they come for the stories, stories of life and death, love, forgiveness, redemption, stories that invite people to be more fully human, and by being more fully human, to touch the divine. The Camino is many things, but ultimately it's a story, a story of journeys to Santiago de Compostela, and within those journeys, individual journeys of faith and doubt, journeys that often begin with great questions and sometimes end with important answers. Journeys often rooted in love of man and love of God. For over a thousand years, men and women have entered the story of the Camino, and many have been transformed by the story, by the quiet and the conversation, the prayer and reflection, the angels and prophets they encounter, by partners on the journey. 
all human, and all in some way divine. There is a transcendence to the Camino experience that allows us to see the transcendence in our larger lives. I'm a theologian by training, so I spend a fair bit of time thinking about God. My kids give me a lot of grief for that. And gathered here are people of different faith traditions and no faith traditions at all. People with deep faith, people with deep doubt, people with many questions, and often people embodying all those things at once. Throughout history, God has revealed God's self through stories. For believers and non-believers alike, stories are a source of growth, of wisdom, of understanding. Humbled by the journey is a great story and a great gift. It is a gift that invites each of us to live our stories, to tell our stories, and even maybe to write our stories. For in living and telling and writing our stories, we grow fully into our humanity and encounter the divine. On quiet stretches of highway, amid flocks of sheep, in conversation with Bienvenido, at the Iron Cross, and in countless other moments, this was my story on the Camino with Mike, a story of the human and the divine, a journey and a story for which I'm deeply grateful. Thank you, Mike, for the gift you have given us and the story you have shared. Thank you for coming. So uh, why don't you uh, identify yourself um, so that uh, Irvin and Mike know who you are and ask your question and let's go at it. <laughs> Is the mic on, folks? Can you all hear in the back? No. So we need somebody who knows about sound to yeah. fix this. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're back in business. My name is Mark. I live on Miami Beach. Thank you for amazing, uh, incredible, fun lessons. Question is for Mike. Mike, you've got quite a track record on giving back to the community. Recently, you proposed an amazing project with a flag for the city of Miami. You were going to do the whole thing, but local politicians, to, to be fair, have not embraced it, and you, I think the Herald reported, were flabbergasted. So the question is, what did you learn from that experience? And perhaps more importantly, what should we, the public, know about the politicians and the political process? Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not about to throw anyone under the bus tonight. <laughs> but what I will tell you this, who, who, I'm, who I'm relying on. Uh, I am relying on, on, on the um, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce to put this process through. Obviously, they have a lot more leverage than I do. Uh, and, and if they deliver the, the permits, I do not want the land. It's their land. It's their flag. It's my nickel that I'm willing to spend. So we can all look at that beautiful vision of our, of our flag flying 50 stories high. Yes, sir. My name is Carson, and my name is Carson, and I wanted to know what is the success to life. Wow. Well, first of all, come here. Uh, well, no, come. I want somebody to bring him all the way to the stage. Come on up. No, 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 no. Bring him around. That's great. Yeah. And would Ray Allen and A-Rod come up here real quick, please? <laughs> All right. Yes, I'm just OK. Now, the number one thing is you got to be a good son to your parents, right? And make sure you follow 
all the rules and things that they set, right? All right. Then we got to get a good education, right? We're going to make sure our grades are good, right? Now, the key for you for success, a lot of times in our community, we got to see success before we can actually believe we can achieve success. So guess why I had these two guys come up here? Because I want you to turn around. Now, who is that? Ray Allen, that's right. And who is that right there? Right. And then I want you to look at this guy. Now, guess what? The key to success, uh, now you're shaking a billionaire's hand. And so, you see, you see what I'm saying? Now, if we get good grades, if we listen to our parents, if we dream outside our community, because that's what made me successful. Because even though I grew up poor, I didn't have poor dreams. You see what I'm talking about? Okay, so we're gonna get a picture of all four of us with you. You're gonna hang the picture up at your house. And every time you say, man, I'm struggling with something, I want you to look at Ray Allen and remember that jump shot he hit, that three-pointer. <laughs> And remember how tough that was, right? Then you're going to have a picture of A-Rod that he hears a 120-mile-an-hour fastball that he has to hit. And remember, he's been hitting a whole lot of home runs, right? And then this guy named Magic. Don't worry about him. You know, he's been okay. Okay? All right. So here we go right here. Come on. We're going to we get the chair out the way. On the seat. Okay. Stand up on the seat. Stand up. Stand up. Okay, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't hear you, Miami. Come on. This is what it's all about. Little boy, this is what it's all about. Thank you. Do we have a pen? Dave, do we have a pen? We want to all sign this for him. Here we go. Hey, hold on, little man. We're going to Okay, thank you. We're going to sign it for you. So all of us. Take it home. Okay. Pass it down. Yeah, you're going to remember this day, right? You're going to tell all your friends tomorrow <laughs> at school? Yeah. I have a field trip. You have a field trip tomorrow? Okay, you tell everybody on the bus what happened, all right? <laughs> now, yeah, 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 I know. All right, give me some knuckles. Give Ray some knuckles. <laughs> give Mike some knuckles, yes. Let's give it up for the little man. That's what it's all about. Put your hand up there. And while you're clapping... While you're clapping, you got to stand on your feet for Ray Allen bringing you that championship. Come on. You got to get it up for Ray Allen. Give it up for the man who also lived here, University of Miami, hit all those home runs. Alex A-Rod Rodriguez. Give it up for Alex. All right. Cool. All right, young man. We love you, so we're going to get back to the questions, okay? Make sure Dad gets you back, okay? No, this is what it's all about. We're touching these young people. Sir, you got the question. Thank you, Magic. Uh, Mike, and Mike, thank you for coming here to Miami-Dade and you know, presenting yourself. Um, my question is, what's the secret to success? Mm. Well, well I, I, I'm joking. No, I, I think that... You, you have to, what is the secret of success? first of all, I, I think believe in yourself. Um, for me. Yeah, Mike, I'm, Magic, it was a joke. No, okay. Oh, I thought you was, oh, go. What is what it is something then? Similar to that? What's your question then? My question is, when, this, this question is for the both of you. Okay. When did you guys realize 
you guys could be successful in business and in life? Well, for me, it really started on the basketball court. And, um, but I'm glad I didn't believe that I was as good as people were telling me that I was. And I kept working so hard. And I never bought into the hype. I, I can only jump this high. But I really, fundamentally, I was very sound. And I, um, I was a fierce competitor. And I studied a lot. And I studied the bad games as well as the good games that I had to make sure I could improve. I, I looked at film a lot. And I stayed in the gym. I was a gym rat. And I think it carried over to my business. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy who just stays in the office. I work all day. Um, that's what I'm all about. Even on the weekends, the wife and I, I'm going to cut the phone off, take her to that movie she wants to go see. I'm going to cut it back on. I always tell her, okay, I need five minutes. I got to step away. I need this. I don't do it during the movie, but I do it after the movie or before the movie. And when Mike and I get to this level, and he's on a whole nother level than I am, I mean way level, way, way, way. You, I, I want to clarify that my billionaire numbers are in Mexican pesos. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it just comes natural that we're going to work seven days a week in a sense. And, um, um, and so that's been the key to my success is just outworking people, understanding what my customer base wanted in urban America and over delivering to them. Also getting into the community, walking door to door, shaking the hands, kissing the babies. And I, even today I continue to do that. I, I love doing that. I'm a people person. I love, Mike and I are both people person. I mean, it's crazy how we're so much alike. Mom, <laughs> you sure you didn't have me? <laughs> you sure this 6'9 guy that come out, stand, stand on up. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> I see where you get your personality <laughs> from now. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to turn it over to him. I'm, I'm just so blessed. Uh, I think you said something that is so for profound when you said don't let anybody um, define, you. define you and I never let anybody define me as just a basketball player I think that's what really helped me become successful He's, he said it all <laughs> I, I, I've never bought the uh, the PR uh, I'm still grounded I outwork still everyone that I've ever known that I've worked with and to me, Sunday night, it's like when I was a kid, Friday night. Friday night was the next day I got to play. Sunday night for me, it's the next day I get to play. So it's the enjoyment of what I do, which, which is the passion of what I do. It's not a job anymore. Next question. My name is Michael Miran, and over 30 years, I've been a great fan of yours. I love everything that you've done in your life. I'm grateful to God to have you to accomplish so much and impacted so many people in, in so many ways. Thank you. Welcome to Miami. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm a little bit shaken. I always dream about seeing you in person, but I never thought I'm gonna walk in like this. <laughs> so please forgive me for no, that. No, no. Uh, I'm very casual today. No. Uh, I'm a little a small entrepreneur uh, trying to follow up your lead. I have read your book, mm -hmm. and I want to uh, give you a little word of uh, encouragement, if I may. Uh, you're doing a great job, and uh, you're making an impact so much community all over the country. Um, uh, you said it well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Made a great impact on the community. Yes. One of the, one of the things that uh, you mentioned in your book, I remember the days that you had the inspiration to be a businessman, 
and you were talking to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and some other players, and they always were telling you, oh, they were laughing at you, actually. Right, right. They were saying, oh, you're not, never going to make it. But guess what? They should see that today. Oh, uh, thank, <laughs> you. Okay? thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Um, I, I think to that point, what we just said, I didn't let anybody define who I was. I didn't care that my teammates didn't believe my dreams or didn't think that I could become a businessman. I believed in myself. I got me 20 mentors to mentor me. Today I have one of the biggest giants in the world to mentor me and his name is Mike Fernandez sitting right next to me. Um, you have to understand that if you're going to accomplish anything in life, you have to believe in yourself. Yes, sir. Right? Then I believed in my strategy. Even when Tim Banks turned me down, they didn't want to invest with me because they said, oh, you're a basketball player. You don't know business. I want the picture and the autograph, but I don't, I'm not going to invest with you. I kept going. And finally, one said, I do believe in you and your strategy. And then I took off. And then the last thing I'm going to tell you, which is really important, institutional capital didn't believe in urban America. I know. So I went up there to where we go is to Sacramento. Like you would go to Tallahassee, we go to Sacramento. And I went up there to start a fund, my first uh, real estate fund. They turned me down four or five times, right? The committee sit up on a dais like this, you're down there. I was sweating like crazy. I had never been so nervous in my life to see 20 people going to decide my fate if I'm going to get some money from them. But I went back up there that fifth time, and they finally said yes. And the key for them saying yes was this. I mean, I'm sorry. The key for me after they said yes was this. I wanted to over-deliver to them to show them that I knew my business and that I could really do it. And sure enough, I bought a shopping center for $22 million. I sold that shopping center for $48 million, took the 26 back up north to them and said, here's your profit. And they said, oh, I guess you do no business. <laughs> Mike and I have been proving people wrong sure. our whole life. Right? We don't care if they don't like us. We don't care if they don't believe in Cuban Americans or African Americans. We're going to prove to them that we know our business, that we can drive our ROI, that we can help our community, that we can help our people, and we can employ our people, and that we can also work with our own people, and we can make a difference. And guess what? We've done it. We can do good and do well at the same time, and we've been able to do that. No, I know that. Uh, lady, lady. So I got to let the next yeah. person. I got to let the no, next person. No, I just want to see. You said you log hog. I happen to log hog too. Yeah, Can I you will. You? Come here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come and give you a big one. <laughs> now, I'm ladies too, and gentlemen, I, we I'm too old to jump back up there, though, Dave. <laughs> I want to so see I, that. I'm going to go to sh shortcut. <laughs> we promised everyone we would finish this program at 8. And out of fairness to everybody, that's what we're going to do. That gives us about eight minutes. Ask a question, this please, is very sir. short. My name is Joseph Glavin. I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And you guys are the dream team of business, and you're going to have a great impact on America. I think it's the beginning of a relationship. So um, what's next on your agenda? To cure diabetes or open up a sports <laughs> franchise? Or what, what's next on your guys' agenda? Can you share us? Well, we're meeting tomorrow to see what is it that we do next. <laughs> and that's true. We're having lunch together. <laughs> Great, because you Next guys question. can change America. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Sonny, and I'm a graduate of Miami Dade College, chemistry major at FIU. All right, yeah. Very good. Um, I grew up in a disenfranchised community here in Miami. Recently lost my father, and I'm starting medical school in the fall. Yet my biggest challenge since starting a community organization is trying to inspire the youth from my community to believe in education. How can I do so? You already did it. Well, thank you. No. 
What you get ready to start in the fall? Excuse me? What, what are you getting ready to start? You getting ready to start Medical what? school. All right, say that one more time. Medical school. God bless you. Oh, hope, hope. You got to go back and tell everybody what you're getting ready to do. Will do. And then when you graduate, you got to come back and say, hey, I'm a doctor right. now. And I look just like you. I came from this community. You see what I'm saying? Thank you. Okay, and you got to come back to Miami-Dade and talk to the students, show them that you're a doctor, show them where you, where, where, where you work, your office, bring those kids to your office, on and on and on, because that will change their mindset. So that's what you can do. Be successful. Graduate and become that doctor that you want to become, okay? Thank you. You got it. My name is Frudrius Porter. I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. This is not a disenchanted area. Great people come from here. Mm -hmm. But I want to challenge you gentlemen with a question. I'm a veteran of the United States military. Give us a voice. Nobody really pays attention. Nobody takes the time to go down to the VA. Give us a voice. Okay. I, yeah. Thank you for what you've done for the country. We appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My I'm, name is Beatrice Louis Saint, and I'm an immigrant from Haiti. I run the Minority Supplier Development Council. I've never heard anyone in this community in a position of power say what you said about diversity and inclusion. D the lack of diversity and inclusion is our open secret as a community. Um, so happy to see that both of you are in business. There aren't enough Hispanics and black people in this community that do business together. My question is, how do we be more inclusive as a community? And I flew in from New York and paid extra to be here. I want you to speak at my 40th anniversary event. And I have a letter for you. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think that how do we do it is that Mike and I have set the example that we didn't look at each other in our race. We just came together and knew that we could do great things together. And also, he has, happens to be Cuban, and I happen to be African American. I think we got to make the race secondary. It, this is what's important, that we came together had a great business and a great strategy, and it worked. And um, I respect him and his heritage and his background. He gave me the same type of respect, and um, that's what it's all about. But you still have to have a common uh, goal and, and, and come together and have uh, be like-minded, and we are both like-minded. And so I'm gonna let him take it from there. But I, 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 he's my brother. I, I mean, I love this man, and, and and his family is great. And and it's never been about our race. It's always been about uh, just love, respect, business, and how can we make a difference and bring the best health care that our patients and clients have ever seen, and we delivered. And I want to thank everybody. A lot of our people are here. I want to thank them. Because we deliver to those patients. Unbelievable. But he does require that my wife cooks chocolate chip cookies. All, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think like, like in order for any relationship to, 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 to excel, you need to align incentives. We knew where our incentives, we knew where we wanted the, the end game to be. And we aligned the incentives to where the patient want one, the doctor won, the community won, and we won. It was not we won at the expense of somebody else. Everyone won. Alignment of incentives. Great powerful tool. Great point. Last question. Hi, my name uh, is Day Sharid. Hey, I sweetie. attend Richmond Heights Middle School, and I'm 11 years old. How are you? I'm good. Thank Aww. you. Um, I know you two are busy persons just like myself. I go to school, I'm an AB student. 
I am in a sorority meetings and I go to church. How can busy people just like ourselves find time to develop new, new opportunities such as babysitting businesses? Ba did you say babysitting business? That's what you do? Uh, yes. Oh, great. First of all, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Well, I think both of us had, had jobs like you. I had a paper route. I mean, I, I worked at the local uh, uh, store, uh, bringing, uh, delivering people's groceries. Uh, once they put the order in, I would take them and deliver them to their home. Uh, I did just about everything there, there could possibly do, be and do in order for me to uh, have extra money in my pocket. But I'm gonna tell you the one thing that turned my life around because you need to know this, okay? There was a local African-American businessman who showed me that we could own car dealerships and businesses. I didn't know we could do that, right? So I was taken back by, by them. It was two of them, Joe Ferguson and Greg E. So I got bold one day. And I went up to them while they were eating at a local restaurant. And I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I want to work for you guys one day. I know you own these buildings and everything. And they felt so good that I had approached them. They gave me one, really my first real job, right? cleaning the office building. And it was seven floors. So I had from Friday to Sunday to clean these, this office building. So, what's your name again? Deja. Stacia? Deja. Deja. I got it? Yes. Deja. So, Deja, I would get up to the seventh floor, right? And I would get to, let's say, Mike's office. And I would bust in Mike's office and start pretending I was Mike. <laughs> right? This is the CEO's office. I would kick my feet up on Mike's desk like this. <laughs> Recline the seat back, and I started dreaming that I was Mike and I was really the CEO. So Deja, then I would hit the intercom button on the phone and <laughs> pretend I had an assistant out front. And let me come up with one of our names. I would say, Aisha, <laughs> would you come and bring me the day's paper and coffee and donuts? And I pretend that she would come in, bring me the coffee, donuts, and the day's paper. So here I am dreaming for two, three hours on that seventh floor in the CEO's office, and guess what happened? Forty-something years later, I am the CEO, right? So for you, as you're doing what you're doing, I want you to start dreaming that you have a big business, even at your age today. Because one day, you're gonna be an incredible businesswoman, or you may be a councilwoman, or you may be a doctor, lawyer, whatever. Just because you're poor, don't mean you have to have poor dreams. And see, I was a big dreamer, and I'm still a big dreamer today. So remember that, that's the key for you. Educate your mind, get good grades, go on and do great things, but dream. And so let me turn it over to the man that I'm dreaming that I would be like one day. You know, I, Aisha, all I can tell you is now I know who sat at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Come here and give me a hug, baby. <laughs> Come here and give me a hug. All right, come here, little man. Come I'm here, gonna come here. Come on, come on. We're gonna, we can't let him. What's your question? We're not gonna leave without you. At, give me a hug first. Bam. Okay. What's your question? Hello, my name is Joseph Thomas. The school that I go to is Baba Hawkins University. I am part of the 5,000 role model program. The question I wanted to ask is, what is your one life? What is your one struggle in school when you was a boy, and how did you overcome it? Wow. Ooh. Wow. Well, come here. I'm going to start with me, and then I'll pass it on to my friend over there. What's your name again? Joseph. Joseph, 
I was in the seventh grade reading at the fifth grade level. My counselor pulled me in and said, Irvin, I got some bad news for you. If you keep reading the way you're reading, you're never going to go to college and you can't play basketball anymore. She said, I got a solution for your problem, but you're not going to like it. You're going to have to go to summer school for the next couple years so that we could bring your reading level back up. That means you can't play, do anything. You got to get on that bus during the time that it's hot, everybody else swimming, doing other things, and you got to work on your reading level. So, young man, I got on that bus and I worked on my reading. Then when I came back to school, they gave me a couple courses, reading courses, to also work on my reading. They made me take a lot of books home to work on my reading. So by the time I got done, I was not only reading at my grade level, I surpassed my grade level in terms of reading. So sometimes what you have to do is say, I have a problem, and this is what I have to do, uh, do about that problem in terms of I have to make sure that I come up with a solution for that problem. And then don't be afraid to say, I got a problem. See, a lot of times we want to say, oh man, I don't, no, I really don't have a problem. I knew I had a reading problem. But I made sure I corrected that problem by going to summer school, okay? Is that cool? Now, let's go with the big bopper here. I want you to go up on stage and, and oh, he's going to come down. Okay, good. Uh, I got problems, too. And I'm hoping you can give me some advice. How are you doing in school? Good. What is your most difficult class? Reading, too. Reading, too. Do you like history? Yes. What part of history do you like? Social studies. Social studies. Ooh, very, very wow. strong. So if you read something that you like, you will begin to read better. You will begin to understand it better. But you have to find something that you really, really like. I love history. And I love to read about pirates. And that taught me a lot about my own country. Jamaica, Cuba, the Caribbean. So if you read about something that you like, you will become a better reader. Because I too, like the three of us, my problem with kind of inability to focus, reading was an issue. But you and I are very similar. And so is my boss here, very similar. But he's given you a good solution to your problem. And you've given me an idea of what you need. You need to read more of what you like. Yes. All right, come on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Urban Johnson and Mike Fernandez. You, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, David. And let's give Dave Lawrence a big hand as well. Mitch, thank you. And thank you all for coming as well. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the journey can continue. If you want to purchase a book, the books are available right outside. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>